Good to see each one of you here. It's uh, the deep part of summer. Praise the Lord. You know, one year ago, uh, it was a handful of us, and we did that alternate thing. I think it was the 28th or 27th or whatever of August last year. But, uh, of course, the wildfires were burning through our city and area and Kelowna. Uh, very tense times those were. This summer, uh, I don't remember it ever being socked in like it has been at times. Even some other years, there's been some really heavy smoke. So that has been a blessing. Of course, it's still not over, but uh, thank the Lord day by day. Well, today, uh, it's good to be with you in person. And um, we can direct our thoughts toward the Lord, toward his sanctuary. And uh, here we call on his name also in this time, in our needs now. And he knows them before we even voice them, but it's still in faith, his gift to us that we trust and then bring those very things to him. Today we follow the service of the word as we have uh, printed it here. And I invite you to stand as we begin with the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The opening hymn, 794, The Lord my God be praised. beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord. Studied by all who delight in them. 
Full of splendor and majesty is his work. And his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 to 10. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple... Let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We sing the gradual hymn, verses 1 and 2. This is also the hymn of the day, 696. O oh God, my faithful God. Therefore, do not associate with them, 
For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. <coughs> Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Worship continues with the gospel anthem. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, 712. you to stand in honor of the Holy Gospel and be joined together in the verse. Alleluia. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is according to St. John chapter 6, as we have been following this chapter these last number of weeks on the bread of life. We read today, verses 51 through 69. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, 
you have no life in you. <clears throat> Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. We continue then with verses 3 through 6 of the Hymn of the Day, 696. O oh God, my faithful God. Number at verse 3. Keep me from saying words that later need recalling. Guard me lest idle speech may from my lips be falling. But when we
again, thank you, Audrey, for your providing uh, for the uh, messages and the prayers uh, from the Lutheran Church Canada resources for congregations in situations like we have been. Uh, today's um, message, I, I don't know who, they never publish who the actual writer of the message is. Uh, some of our seminary professors uh, and other mission uh, execs and stuff may be among those contributing. And uh, this looks, it's very helpful. It's teaching me about this, uh, what can be kind of a difficult text. It's very challenging. Um, and that's right in the message that we'll hear too. But uh, uh, Luther actually said on this section in John 6, now this is not about the Lord's Supper directly, but yet it certainly points to something important and greater than what we would even know. So may the Lord open our hearts on the text as it does, uh, uh, one commentator was saying, um, so it's not directly of the Lord's Supper, but the Lord's Supper is included in this bigger truth, which is the Son of God is with us and offers himself that we may have eternal life. That's the big point. And the Lord's Supper serves in that same way as baptism and faith through his word, all these means of grace. Anyway, may the Lord guide us and bless us. Uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This message is entitled, How Can This Be? How can this be? That's essentially the question that the, quest that the cr crowds have been questioning and who have been listening to Jesus in the gospel readings these last three weeks finally up asking directly in our reading today, how can this be, they say? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? In one sense, it is a good question, a really good question. What Jesus has been saying to us in here, in the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, defies any logic, any rationality, any human understanding. If you and I had been there among that crowd, and had stood there listening to Jesus talk extensively about how he is the bread of life that came down from heaven. And if we had heard him say that everyone who eats the bread that he gives will live forever, and then finally, if we heard him conclude the point that he has been making for some 30 verses now by saying that the bread that he gives for the life of the world is his flesh, we would probably be asking the same thing. We'd be asking, how can this be? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? In that sense, how can this be is a good question. In the same time, at the same time, however, as Jesus answers this question, or more accurately, as Jesus doesn't answer this question, he shows us that it is entirely the wrong question to be asking. The crowds asked how, but Jesus answers with why. So he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Jesus does not explain how this can be or how he intends to give his flesh to these people for them to eat. He does not answer the how question. He answers the why question. Why does this man give us his flesh to eat? The reason, Jesus says, is simple. Why does he give us his flesh to eat? Because without it, without his flesh and blood to eat and drink, we have no life in us. And with that, with his flesh and blood, we have eternal life, and he will raise us up on the last day. That's the why. That's what matters. The how question that the crowds asked when they heard Jesus talk about his flesh being the bread that he gives for the life of the world betrays what they think about who he is. How can this man 
give us his flesh to eat, they wonder. For them, Jesus is just a man. They made it clear earlier in the conversation, too, when, as we heard last week, they grumbled about Jesus because he had said that he came that he came down from heaven. They knew, or thought they knew, his fa mother and father were certain he had not. They thought or thought they knew his father and mother. For that reason, they were certain he had not come down from heaven. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, they said? For them, Jesus was not the son of God in human flesh. To them, he's just another man. For them, the words that they heard Jesus speaking were not the words of the Son of God. To them, they were just the words of another teacher. As such, they did not believe that he had come down from heaven. They did not believe that he could give his flesh as the bread of life. And they walked away from him, leaving the promises that he was offering to them, sitting on the table. You and I know, however, that Jesus is God's Son. We know that his words are true. We know that because of our fallen sinful nature and condition, there is not life in us. And we know, even though we may not understand how, that our Lord Jesus does give his flesh and blood as true food and true drink to give life to the world. We know and believe these things. At the same time, however, the, the temptation always remains to doubt. Our minds, seeking to be wise by worldly standards, begin to question if the words we read in Scripture could really be God's Word. Ideas from out there in the world creep into our minds, suggesting that perhaps these are just the words of men. The disciples of Jesus, for example, who did their best to get everything down right, but made some mistakes along the way. Or that the words of the Bible were true for people in one time, but might mean something different for us today. Or that some parts of the Bible, the New Testament, for example, are true, but other parts, like the Old Testament, or just made-up stories. The source of these ideas of this kind of thinking is none other than Satan himself. He always wants us to be wondering as we read and hear God's word. Did God really say that? Under the guise of wisdom and understanding, Satan tempts us to believe that we somehow know better than God, that we understand this world, our lives, and everything about them better than he does. This, of course, is a lie and the opposite of wisdom. In fact, it is foolishness. <coughs> wisdom, however, real wisdom, Godly wisdom begins with fearing God. Proverbs chapter 9 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Wisdom begins with fearing God, respecting Him as the source of everything that exists, the giver of all that is good, the just lawmaker, the forgiver of sins. Wisdom begins with understanding and accepting that God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. It begins with accepting God's word as God's word and believing it because it is God's word. From there, wisdom flows. When we come to his word, his banquet table, as, as simple, unlearned people lacking in sense, he fills us with his wisdom to know the depth of his love for us that would send a Savior to us to give his flesh for us on the cross and rise from the dead 
that we who have no life in us might live in him. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, Jesus says, has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the, Father, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. In these words, it is as if Jesus, the real wisdom of God, is setting a table before you and inviting you to come, sit, and eat. He offers to fill you with his goodness, his love, his forgiveness. He offers you his life. He offers you freely everything that he has won for you by his death on the cross and his rising from the dead. After Jesus said these things, when his discussion with the crowds who had followed him from the other side of the lake and who had been fed by his hand miraculously with five loaves and two fish, finally it came to an end, John says that many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Why? Because they could not see how this could possibly be. In their own so-called wisdom, they walk away from the source of true wisdom, God himself with them in the flesh. And as they walk away, they look what they left on the table eternal life, resurrection on the last day, abiding in Christ, having Christ abide in them, living because of him, living forever, forgiveness of sins, peace, joy, and yes, even wisdom. Wisdom, human, true, humanly wisdom, cast these things aside for the sake of understanding, but faith rejoicing in God's word and promises, clings to these things as our sure and only hope. When those who were offended by Jesus' words and refused to believe his teaching had left him, he then turned to the twelve. The faithful, or not so faithful, Twelve disciples who just the night before had been terrified when they saw him walking on the water and said, Jesus now said, do you want to go away as well? As he often did, Simon Peter spoke up on behalf of the rest and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. To be sure, Peter and the others did not understand how Jesus could give his flesh for people to eat any more than the others in the crowd that day did. Throughout their time with Jesus, they struggled day by day, moment by moment, to believe and trust his words. More often than not, their faith failed, just as it had in the boat. But in this moment, by God's grace, they trusted in his words. They confessed the truth. The words of Jesus are the words of eternal life. They didn't understand how Jesus' words could be true. And they certainly did not know how it all worked or had it all figured out. But they knew that no one had ever spoken like this before. And as a result, they had concluded that these words, even if they were hard and difficult to understand, were worth believing. For Jesus said them, and they came to know him, you are the Son of God. So it is with us. We don't often understand. We struggle. We doubt. We question. 
But it always comes back to this. Whose word is it? Are these words, the words we read in Scripture, just the words of some man, or are they the words of the Son of God? If these words of the Son of, if these are the words of the Son of God, are they not worth believing in even if we don't understand them? And these are the words of eternal life. Thanks be to God that we, by His grace and the working of His Holy Spirit, have believed and come to know that He, our Lord Jesus, is the living God who gives His flesh as our bread of life. There is no life in us apart from Him, but with Him and in Him we have life, life that lasts forever. All in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I invite you then to stand up and confess your faith with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We gather the offering, and we will be singing the offering hymn, uh, 789, uh, as it's titled, Praise and Thanksgiving. Praise and thanks be
brings us then to the prayer of the church. Let us pray. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, the words of our Savior are spirit and life. Give us grace to cling to them always, but especially when we find them hard to listen to, that we may discover with Peter and the other apostles that Christ alone has the words of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, look in mercy on all the baptized. Pour out your spirit on them and fill them with the light of your word so that your people may live as children of the light, taking no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Wisdom from on high. You set a table before us in word and supper and summon us to leave our simple ways and live, walking in the way of insight. Remember our synod president, Timothy Teuscher, our regional pastor, Rob Mons, and all the pastors of our synod and those who serve in your church. Grant that they may always increase in learning and find knowing you to be the path of insight. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Raise up, we beg, Lord, ever new workers for your harvest fields, determined like Joshua of old to serve you alone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Ruler of all, look in compassion on our nation's prime minister, on all who serve in the parliament and in the provincial government, on all judges and those who serve in our armed forces. Uphold them in honor and integrity and make them a blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Father, your son is the healer of the sick, the resurrection of the dead, and our bread of life. Hear our prayers today for those who suffer, those taking treatment, treatments or facing surgery, the sick and those who are dying. We especially commend to, to your loving hands uh, all those uh, of our congregation and our families and loved ones and friends and our community. In particular, I would bring before you Renee and her friend Jesse, also Richard, Lee and Linda, uh, Val and Calvin. Also, we pray for my uncle Gordon undergoing chemo. Uh, Lord, be also with me yet in fuller recovery. Be with all your loved ones, O oh Lord. Uh, be also with Heinz in his time of busyness and of serving in his vocation right now. Thank you for the gifts of each one. And Lord, especially uh, bring before you Ginger and pray that uh, your gracious working of holy baptism uh, may now soon be uh, administered, that she be welcomed by your grace through the promise of baptism into your eternal family and kingdom. Be with Joyce as well in these uh, challenging days. Comfort them, sustain them all with your powerful word, granting whatever healing you will, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you chose the Virgin Mary to be the mother of your only son. Grant that we who are redeemed by his blood may share with her in the glory of your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bountiful giver, your son assures us that his flesh is true food and his blood true drink, and that those who feed on him will live forever because of him. By your spirit, prepare our hearts to welcome him as he comes to us in the blessed sacrament the next time we receive it that we may rejoice in his promises and depart in his peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Source of all life, on the great day of the resurrection, your Son will call all who fell asleep in him to arise from the dead and shine in his light. 
Receive our thanks for the faithful who have departed this life, trusting in his promises. Bring us with them into the light of that day that has no evening. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite the congregation then to stand as we join in the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Then we share the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. We then conclude with the hymn 876, O Blessed Holy Trinity. O blessed Holy Trinity, Good to be together. God's peace.